I am going to call this Braver Angels debate to order. And the resolution on the table is resolved. The American experiment is failing. Resolved. The American experiment is failing. I am looking for a first speaker in the affirmative. And I would like to call if he is available on uh, Mr. Stephen Lumsdane. Stephen, you have four minutes. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, then let's get started. I'm gonna be speaking on the affirmative and uh, this is why. Um, I think when the United States was founded, um, the goal was that a legislation appointed by, at the time, some of the people would be the main political power in the land. Today, every presidential election elects the most powerful peacetime president in the history of our country. Every election cycle, the most powerful person in the world grows more powerful. The three balancing powers of federal government now look like a pyramid with the executive on top and the judicial and legislature acting as second tier, if you will. The current tone of political divisiveness only drives increased congressional inaction. When a senator or representative works in compromise with the opposing political party, they open themselves to primary challenge in their own elections. Um, and they open themselves to challenge from multiple directions. The argument that they're betraying their party and working with the enemy to pass either oppressive or woke legislation, whether true or not, is something many voters find compelling. So it is often easier to refuse compromise than many issues of major importance com Congress instead opts for inaction. That combined with more time spent fundraising than legislating has left Congress neutered. Um, this void is filled in part by the rising influence of the judiciary branch, but mostly by the executive branch and the president. Executive orders and federal departments operate far outside the scope set by our early founders. A simple example of this is our nation's relation to war. Officially, the United States has not been at war since 1942. Of course, Korea, Vietnam, and countless engagements in the Middle East would beg to differ. The ability to declare war, a choice of huge impact and importance, was originally given to the legislative branch and legislative alone. Those directly representing the people would make the choices as to whether American sons and daughters should die in conflict on foreign soil or our own shores. However, beginning with Truman in the Korean War, presidents have chosen to just ignore this, um, commanding armed forces to engage in multiple conflicts without legislative authorities. Congress fixed this problem in 1973 by passing the War Powers Resolution Act. The president now must confer and notify Congress within 48 hours of engaging in military conflict. And after 60 days, if Congress has not decided to declare war or extended the deadline, the conflict has to stop. Of course, well, I'm sure Congress patted itself on the back at the time, no member of Congress today is going to pull US soldiers out of the middle of a war zone just to flex congressional muscle. Like much in the federal government, executive power grows as legislative power shrinks. Now we might think that the president is now, as the president is now, though not originally, elected by the people, um, the spirit, if not the letter of the founder's ideals of direct representation stands. Well, due to our current presidential election system, unless you live in one of the handful of swing states, our presidential votes don't really matter. Um, I live in Tennessee and I can go ahead and tell you with confidence which party's candidate all of Tennessee's electoral votes will go to in the next two or three election cycles. This leaves most Americans feeling powerless in presidential election, represented only by Congress that turns belly up at the least sign of presidential power. A nation structured with le the legislative branch first among equals is left instead with executive power far overreaching its original intent. Because of this and how vital legislative representation was to the original construction of our nation, I would say that at best, the American experiment is failing and at worst has already failed. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Let's give a round of jazz hands to our first speaker in the affirmative on this debate. We now have time for a couple questions for the speaker. And if you would like to ask a question of the speaker's speech, uh, please go ahead and raise your Zoom hands now. 
Uh, let's uh, take a first question from uh, Nancy Martin. Uh, Ms. Martin, please unmute yourself. <laughs> ask your question of the speaker to me. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask uh, the speaker if, um, if he feels that perhaps some kind of public financing of elections might help with the problem of, um, of uh, Congress people being um, obsessed with their next campaign and their fundraising for their campaign? Excellent question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm not like super well versed in finance and economics, um, but I do think if there was some maybe a cap or a certain amount of federal funds given to each um, congressional representative in their races, um, rather than a focus on whoever can get the most money, who can be the most controversial to pull in the most funds, um, I think that that would make a difference. What exactly that would look like, I don't know, but I think I think it would be better than our current system and maybe it would help Congress focus more on what it's actually supposed to be doing. And let us take a second question for the speaker from, speaker from Mr. Uh, Chuck Edson. Mr. Edson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, would wish you asked, would ask <coughs> our uh, <coughs> speaker um, whether I, I, I'm confident he agrees with George Washington's uh, belief that uh, political parties are a real source of our problem. I was wondering, and, and that I, I'm beginning to see that as more and more of a more and more of an issue. Thank you. Excellent question, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would definitely agree with that. I think a lot of, again, as I mentioned, issues with compromise in Congress, a lot of issues are related to political parties. And I think our founding fathers did not really anticipate them. And as such, our system doesn't have something built in to support them. All right. Uh, with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Mr. Lumsdane, for opening us up on a great note today. Um, I, as chair, I will merely note that the question of political parties is one of the ones that we were considering for this, uh, this very debate topic. And uh, the chair will smile upon uh, further speeches and further questions over the course of this debate on that very important thing. Um, all right, so with that, uh, we're going to go to our first speech in the negative on the resolution. Um, again, the, uh, the, uh, the resolution on the table is resolved. Uh, the American experiment is failing. I am looking for a first speech in the negative, and I would like to call on Mr. Ted Getchman. Uh, Ted, please unmute yourself. You have four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am speaking in the negative. This is not the end of the great democratic experiment. It's just about to begin. The United States has always been divided from the first elections in 1784 to today, but this division has not been about who we are or what has been happening around us, but it has been about a system, a system that pushes us to divide. It pushed us to divide in 1784. It pushed us to divide in 1860. It pushed us to divide in 1910. It pushed us to divide in 1960, and it pushes us to divide today. Our simple act of casting a ballot divides us into factions, factions that then battle to become the biggest faction. Majority rule creates a minority ignored and Americans don't like to be ignored. Those were not the winners marching on Washington DC in 2017. Those were not the winners attacking the Capitol building in 2021. When we stop asking voters which candidate do you want to represent you? And start asking how much does each candidate represent you? We replace majority rule with majority opinion rule. Every voice contributes to the majority opinion. Every voice is heard when we use max voting methods. Max voting methods are any voting method that allows all voters to rate all candidates highest rated candidate wins. Think Amazon ratings for candidates. People are not the problem, it's the system. And when we change it, we begin the true golden age of democracy. We have no idea how great American can be. 
We have no, we have never seen America at its best, but we can if we have the courage to try. If we implement max voting methods nationwide, it's just common sense. It's just common sense for uniting America. Thank you. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you for an excellent first speech in the negative on this. Uh, a quick note uh, as chair, um, I realize that uh, this will wind up being probably somewhat confusing given that the folks who are in the affirmative are arguing uh, a negative thing that America is bad and or America is, is very much declining. And folks arguing in the negative are arguing what sounds like an affirmative thing uh, that America is in a very is not in a very bad place. Um, I just want to clarify to everybody um, that uh, we that um, uh, uh, as we go forward on this, um, it will it will be that confusing. But I think uh, the first speech is here. The first two and the questions have opened up how that we can address that. So, Mr. Speaker, thank you for having. Uh, been there. With that, we'll go to a couple of questions for the speaker. Let's go first to a question uh, from Ms. Kay Halpern. Uh, Kay, please unmute yourself, ask a question to me of the speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I just have a simple question. Um, Ted, if you could explain a little bit more about how- If the Max speaker could- if the speaker Oh, could. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Could the speaker please explain uh, a little bit more about how Max voting works and is it the same thing as ranked choice voting, for example? I'm just curious um, how, how it works. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, it's very different from ranked choice voting. Max voting methods allow every voter to rate every candidate and the highest rated candidate wins. That can be approval voting, that can be star voting, that can be division free voting. Um, ranked choice voting answers the question, which one candidate do you want to have represent you? And then if they don't win, if they're eliminated, then which candidate do you want to have represent you? And if they're eliminated, then which candidate do you want to have represent you? So it's more like plurality voting on repeat, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, let us go, and because of the, because of the complexity of that particular um, System, if you don't mind, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to actually take three questions for you, not two. Um, so let's go to a second question from uh, Mr. Ian Bars. Ian, please unmute yourself. Ask your question of the speaker to me. Ian, Ian, you're still on mute. Um, Ian, uh, I'm actually going to move on to another another question, and uh, we will come back to you later on. Let's go to a question from Mr. Uh, Richard Proceda. Richard, please unmute yourself. Ask a question of the speaker to me. Hi. The Economist Global Economic Index has, in 2020, ranked us, lowered us from a full democracy to a flawed democracy. We are now the 26th democracy in the United States. And there has been a global decline of democracy around the world that is ongoing. How do you square this with what the position you've taken? With the position the speaker has taken. Thank you very yes. much for that question, Mr. Speaker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the evidence of the absence of max voting is everywhere around us. If we want what we've never had, we have to do what we've never done. Because it is our system that is dividing us, it makes sense that the democracy is getting sicker and sicker. Even if you look at parliamentary governments, even if you look at other democracies, whenever you start by dividing your population, how can you ever hope to be unified? By changing to a system that is driven by the majority opinion, where candidates are encouraged to move to the majority opinion, all the candidates end up representing an opinion established by every voice in that community. That is how we will move forward to a better democracy. I see the United States going to the very top of that list in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We will take uh, one more question for the speaker and let's go to uh, this question from Mr. Uh, Croy Gierek. Uh, Croy, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, you did. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would first off, I just want to agree wholeheartedly with 
um, using score voting or approval voting, I think that that is much better than um, what we have and even still much better than ranked choice. But I just wanted to ask um, the speaker claimed, the speaker was expressing giving a speech in the negative, but it's it seems like the, you know, right now, there's not a lot of momentum towards reforming the voting system. So I'm curious if the speaker believes that um, because there isn't that kind of action, if the speaker might agree with the idea that, you know, right now we're, we're kind of on a downward trend and that we need to, it's more that we need to change course. Important question. Thank you for that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the I I do not believe that. Let's put it this way: we are at the best possible point in time. We now know why we're divided. We're not divided because of us. We're not divided because of the the issues that are going on at the time. We recognize now; it has become recognized now why we are divided. We now understand what we need to do to accomplish it. The genie is out of the bottle. It's now a matter of time before the word is spread, before we as a nation begin to understand and take hold of these max voting, score voting, range voting type methods to, to heal us. Are things as bad as they've always been? No, we fluctuate up and down. I will expect it to continue until we do embrace max voting in the future, Mr. Chair. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much for this first excellent speech, the negative, and for showing us uh, something that I think a lot of us uh, are not fully aware of and uh, opening up an interesting uh, uh, new field of study for some of us to go into. So thank you for that. Uh, with that, we are now going to go to our second speech in the affirmative on the resolution. Again, a reminder, the resolution today is resolved, the American experiment is failing. I am looking for a speech in the affirmative uh, and I would like to call on, uh, where is she? Beth Bauer. Ms. Bauer, please unmute yourself. You have four minutes. Um, our American experiment is failing because we are seeing two extreme American positions fighting against each other and a constitution that was written in 1776 being used by both sides for their own individual advantage, while the rest of the country is in the middle and feeling helpless. Our laws and constitution recognized there would be change in the future and allowed for it, but now there is controversy in interpreting our constitution and how changes could be allowed and made. Since 1776, there have been so many changes in technology, media, medicine, communications, transportation, to name a few that have sped up the problem. One extreme side is on the far right or red side, where it's all about the freedom of the individual and the rights of the individual to do whatever he wants, to keep whatever he makes. Everyone should be responsible for themselves. The government has no right to interfere. Small government, low taxes. The other extreme is on the far left or blue side, where people feel the government is responsible for the welfare of everybody. If someone is hurting or if something needs to be done, the government should fix it and take care of everybody. Big government, higher taxes. Both sides have points, but neither side is totally right. In the meantime, since 1980, the US wealth gap has increased to a point where our middle class is now below middle income. This only exacerbates the extreme side differences between the haves and the have nots, the powerful and the powerless. In addition, each side has their own media sources. So there is no incentive to listen to real facts or to listen to both sides. Instead, we love being fed only the news we want to hear. Our divisive issues could be fixed but instead our two party system uses our current laws and their own interpretations of the constitution to play political gamesmanship, to power out the other side through actions like rigged voting maps, selecting judges with partisan litmus tests, 
and allowing overdoses of dark money with no trail left behind, to name a few. This trickles down to laws, regulations, and funding for almost every area of our lives, regardless of what the majority of the population wants. We are caught in the vice of the tainted political forces around us who use the constitution, laws, and courts to secure their own positions. The American experiment is at risk from our own political system. Our legislators can fix this, but they won't because they have rigged our election system so much that most of them don't have to listen to, to us or represent us in order to get reelected. After this year's primaries, approximately 83% of our legislatures will be selected regardless of how we vote. And about 10% of Americans vote in the primaries. There is no need for both sides to work together for compromises and finding the best solutions to issues that they can work together on. Everything is predetermined. We're stuck feeling helpless, caught in the middle of political warring forces around us. If we don't galvanize our strength and work together to fix our rigged elections and political system, we will go down with the ship and the American experiment will have failed us. Thanks. And just as a, by the way, I am from Wisconsin, supposedly a swing state, and it is very hard to swing right now. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much for this excellent new speech in the affirmative here. Uh, we'll go to a couple of questions for the speaker. I wanna first go to a question uh, from Mr. Thomas Bergdahl. Mr. Bergdahl, please unmute yourself and uh, ask a question to me of the speaker. Mr. Bergdahl, you're still on mute. I'm trying. <laughs> I have to know things are coming. The uh, question that I would have is how are things any different? Uh, now than in in the past. I mean, you say that the speaker. Uh, speaker. Oh, I admit, Mr. If, if you would ask the uh, the speaker uh, that question is is how are things really different today than a day when we had no information? Thank you very much for that, Madam uh, Speaker. Um, well, basically, I'm speaking from a Wisconsin standpoint, and I can say that technology has really perfected the art of gerrymandering. We are so gerrymandered that we have been gerrymandered in Wisconsin for 10 years, and we're going to be gerrymandered for the next 10. And we can't get out of it. We are stuck. And Wisconsin is a legislative state rather than a ballot initiative. So it's going to take the, the legislatures who are guaranteed to be voted in for another 10 years to change it for themselves. And it's going to take a monumental effort to be able to change that. The chair, who is an unreconstructed Hamiltonian Federalist and who is still slightly resentful of, against Mr. Elbridge Jerry for not signing the Constitution and after whom uh, gerrymandering was named, uh, concurrence that gerrymandering is a fascinating subject. So um, let's go to another question for the speaker. Let's go to uh, uh, Manjula Ambor. Uh, Manjula, uh, please unmute yourself and ask a question to me of the speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question to the speaker is about, would it help to have multiple parties? I don't know what constitutional change that needs, needs to happen, but compared to other democracies, Europe and Asia, we don't have multiple parties. Would it help to address the issue of this extreme left and extreme right? Thank you, Ms. Ambor. Madam Speaker? I, I can say yes and no. Um, yes, I'm going to say no in the sense that right now, um, if you come in from a different political party, you're usually considered a spoiler. So in order to have it work, we would have to have some kind of, we're looking at ranked choice voting right now with open primaries where you can have, you can run from any party or you can have multiple people from Democrats and Republicans so you can have more moderates coming in and they're not going to be dictated by party chiefs on the extreme of both sides. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for this excellent second speech in the affirmative. Oh, uh, we are now going to go on to our second speech in the negative. Um, and again, just a quick reminder, the uh, resolution on the table is resolved. The American experiment is failing. 
I am looking for a second speech in the negative on this resolution. And I uh, would like to call on, is you here, Miss uh, Mimi Yang. Uh, Mimi, please uh, unmute yourself. You have four minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. Awesome. Uh, first of all, I'm also in Wisconsin, Kenosha, Wisconsin. I'm speaking to you from there. Um, well, uh, voting and the election, that's a procedure of American experiment. The experiment is much more than that. So what is an experiment? Experiment is a procedure undertaking a, a, a hypothesis and uh, to put in, in, in a laboratory to discover new things or distill or trace a pattern of the unknown facts. That is experiment, it's a scientific process. So voting is just one part of that. It's a very important part of that. I want to speak much more than that voting. Um, since the, well, since the beginning of the country, I like to focus on the model. Uh, in Latin, we say, uh, e pluribus unum, which means from, from many, one. That, to me, that is interpreted as the American experiment. So in the immigrant country, the fortune of one distinct American nationality from diversity of many and yet the seemingly distant racial, ethnic, religious elements has characterized the formation, development, and the evolution of our culture and our ca character. So the, the experience of the United States is an embattled but a consistently multicultural multiracial society does cry out for a renewed inquiry into the American experiment in our time of particular ideological tribalism, political division, and the cultural polarization. So in 2022, has the American experiment been a success or failure? To make the case, the American experiment is a success, I want to focus on the double-edged sword of the model, a pluribus unum. On one hand, it projects the most democratic ideal towards different races and the cultures because it intends to blending everyone into one integrated unity, what you call, right? So, a, that is kind of unprecedented undertaking in human history. No any other country has ever done that before, but only in the US. So whether you call it a melting pot or the God's crucible, I'm using Israel Zangwill's phrase in his 1909 play, The Melting Pot, right? So, um, but on the other hand, if the model is executed with one group dominating and monopolizing Americanness. So this model can be easily maneuvered as a machine of suppression, marginalization, segregation, and polarization. Therefore, there are two competing forces in bringing e pluribus unum to American character and identity, and above all, in designing the melting pot. I mean, the mechanism uh, of, the, uh, of the melting and of the structure of the pot. So about 250 years ago, the American experiment began. The founding fathers laid out and they cemented the design of American pot, American identity and cultural character. So they are mainly white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, so we call them WASPs. Especially John Winthrop's sermon and his dream, A City Upon a Hill, reinforced the Anglo superiority and the dominance in the New World. And also Thomas Jefferson's biblical interpretation of God's in, uh, providence upon the New uh, World also justified the leadership position of Anglos in this country. And then, um, then you would see waves of immigrants and the minority groups have been eager and ready to become Americans and uh, uh, following the script uh, designed by our founding fathers without questioning how they as equal citizens can affect um, or help rigify the character and the designs. So,
So the the e pluribus unum has been meant widening. Assimilation has been meant adopting WASP's values and the dismissing the diversity. Madam, so if you're, we, over, you're slightly over time, uh, can you uh, wrap up in the next 30 seconds or so? Sure. On the other hand, the American experiment is this ideal that the true democratic side, you think about women's rights movement, a civil rights movement, and that the recent uh, BLM movement, they fundamentally challenged the uh, the WASP conformity. So it is another side of experiment. And also I want to uh, 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 make a point is the forum of Brief Angels itself is a, it's a platform for American experiment. And we put the different ideas here into practice in exchange and it itself personifies the success. It, yes, it is possible we can put different in, ingredients into this experiment and then let it work out in a tested, contexted uh, terrain. And we are part of the experiment and we are right in this moment, we are conducting it. Let me just close here. And with that, the speaker is thanked for her excellent speech and her opening up questions of identity that are fascinatingly important for all this question. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, let's go to a couple of questions for the speaker. Uh, let's go first to a question from uh, Mr. Gary Levine. Uh, Mr. Levine, please unmute yourself and ask a question to me of the speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would uh, ask that you ask the speaker how do we get there from here? Um, if the resolution is that we have or have not failed, if that is the binary question we're investigating, given that the Constitution is the framework that we kind of depend on for what protections we have left, but it also has hard coded into it enormous resistance to change. Um, and uh, so, so how do we get there from here? I, I, I agree with everything you said about the possibility of the experiment, but I don't see how the experiment recovers. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Madam Speaker. Well, uh, it is not, so, so Mr. Chairman, what I, it's not a straight line in this experiment. It's not from A to B over there, you would go two steps forward, five steps backward, maybe two steps sideways, and eventually the for, forward move motion is still there because always in competing forces. So let's talk about the current issue, the BLM, right? You know, this comes, especially when you think about the critical race theory, you know, you, you know it's, it's, it's a minefield. And then there's always the forces moving forward, although in a sidetrack for the moment or backwards for three steps. But again, you will see the force moving forward, forward. So it is not a straight line to from A to B. The chair who is an avid reader of various tre uh, treatises of political science is very, very into this particular uh, mechanical metaphysics of things and is eager to find out more from the speaker on this uh, sometime soon. Uh, let's go to a question from Mr. Richard Aberdeen. Mr. Aberdeen, please unmute yourself. Ask a question to me of the speaker. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, when uh, Martin Luther King died or shortly before he died, uh, he was trying to form a poor people's march and the goal was to have a guaranteed living wage, not a minimum wage, but a living wage. And I would ask this, like to ask this person, do you think that's a good idea? And, and the second question, it goes along with it. Why is nobody, and I mean nobody in either party or in our government fighting for a living wage except for Bernie Sanders? Thank you very much, sir, Madam Speaker. Um, you also have to, well, well Mr. Chair, also, I think we need to think about uh, the, the, the DNA of the culture of this country. It's not the socialistic, but the capitalistic. So the parties, both parties, as different as they are, as they want to antagonize with each other, there's a foundation, foundation of this country is capitalism always wins over socialism. So what we, you know, each party cannot possibly speak against its own party. 
So for political tribalism, even they believe that, they wouldn't say, I believe that. They would fight for the opposite. So it's many times, it's not really fight for truth. Bernie Sanders, in many ways, I think he's fighting for truth. It's admirable. However, it, it's like a, the, uh, but a, there's a disparity between what he believes and the American reality. It is very difficult. How you can overcome capitalistic system infiltrated each, each fabric in the society to bring that out. It is very difficult unless you change the culture DNA, reprogram it. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Ms. Yang, for all these excellent insights. And I look forward to seeing how these develop over the course of the this, uh, this debate here. All right, so we are going to go to another speaker in the affirmative. Uh, so uh, please be raising your Zoom hands now if you're interested. But first, I'd like to give another round of jazz hands for all of our excellent first four speakers for opening us up on a good note in this debate. Um, and just as a uh, uh, slightly important side note, um, I did not do my job as a chair in the last couple of days and uh, and give everybody a heads up. I sent a bunch of panicked emails, uh, seeing if a few people would be willing to give speeches about three hours ago. And these first four speakers uh, nobly responded and said, yes, uh, I will concoct gold from straw uh, in time for the debate. And they did, and they've opened us up on a good note. So let's give them another round of jazz hands for being willing to help us out on that front. All right, so with that, uh, I've gotten a lot of uh, queries from folks who are hoping to make speeches. I want to get through as many of these speeches as possible. So we're going to uh, cut down the time for each speaker down to three minutes, and uh, we will probably only take one question per speech, although some of them we might take two. Um, I want to get through as many people as possible, and we will see what we can do in the next hour and seven minutes. So with that, I'm looking for another speaker in the affirmative, and I would like to call on Mr. Dennis Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes for your speech in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman. Uh, the American uh, experience, experiment is falling. First of all, evidenced by our deep, deep divide, which is not new. You know, we've had a huge divide during the Civil War and many since then, but nevertheless, we're in a very deep one right now. We have opposing parties, in other words, Reds, not really participating in Braver Angels to the degree that perhaps uh, they would have uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, we have a news failure. In other words, we have news that is being an advocate versus uh, their, their search for truth. Uh, we have fed, federal regulation, uh, which is not ending, and, and there's no term limits in Congress. We have uh, a congressional seating by party rather than uh, intermixed with, uh, with the parties where the, they can speak together. Uh, we have federal growth in power. Uh, as opposed to or at the, at the expense of the state uh, maintaining its power and the, the, the search for uh, greater centralized power is a further uh, uh, divide between us. Uh, we have a de-emphasis of religion, which, which was the moral fa uh, fabrication that, that uh, held us together uh, in, in common value. We, we move away from the electoral vote to the popular vote. Uh, in other words, de-emphasizing the importance of, of the people in, in uh, separate locations from cities. Uh, we move away from finding common values rather than, uh, than listening to our bubble folks. Um, we have procedural changes to en enhance voter laws. The ultimate key to our democracy, I think, is our vote. Uh, we have procedures that uh, uh, prohibit or do not require voter ID, and uh, we have vote gathering and, and further procedures that continually eat away at our trust in, in voting. I want to thank Braver Angels for helping pull us together, this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful organization. Uh, where together we can pull America together. And without Braver Angel's vision taking hold, I, I think the American ex experiment is failing. And I offer hope that we can turn it around. 
And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, let us go to uh, one question for the speaker. Uh, let's go to a question from uh, Sherry Raiders. Ms. Raiders, do you have a question for the speaker? Ms. Raiders? Yes, I do. Um, my question is, do we, does the speaker think that perhaps it's time for a constitutional convention so that we really can address some of these issues, some of these voting issues, you know, I'm, I'm a, I lean very blue and it's very distressing to me that, that states with so few voters have so much power compared to a state like California or New York. So, I, you know, I know a constitute, okay, uh, that's my yeah. question. Yes. Does the speaker think a constitutional convention would help? Thank you very much for the question, man. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Yes, um, Mr. Chair, I'm uh, much in agreement to have an unconstitutional convention. Yes. Well, and I'm a red, by the way. So you and I are uh, the speaker and, or the question and I are uh, on different parties, but nevertheless agree that we all need to pull ourselves together and, and rethink our voting laws. Uh, the chair smiles upon all aspects of common ground that uh, that arise, although uh, the chair will merely note that uh, whatever common grounds that do arise, these are not necessarily all things that everybody is on, but it is wonderful to open up uh, opportunities for them. So thank you both for, uh, for opening that. Uh, with that, the speaker is thanked, and we will now go on to our next speech in the negative on the resolution. Um, and again, the resolution on the table right now is resolved. The American experiment is failing. I'm looking for a speech in the negative. I am looking for a speech in the negative. Um, uh, is uh, Susan McCord still here with us and hoping to make the speech I was told she was going to make? Susan McCord? All right, seeing Susan McCord is uh, not with us at the moment, I'm going to call then on uh, Mr. David Ulmer. David? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'll point out, you know, we didn't actually start with the U.S. Constitution. We started with the Articles of the Confederation. Uh, it was a flawed document. The Constitution, as it was written, was focused on a Bill of Rights and protecting the individual for government. Our Tenth Amendment, uh, the enumerated powers, put the powers mainly with the states and the individuals. So I think too many times we look to the federal government when the constitution was not even designed to do that. Uh, we have had amendments. We forget that it used to be to uh, prohibition, the income tax, huge change in this country at the federal level required huge majorities. Think of FDR. He was working with majorities between 70 and 80%. That's what it took. We have survived the civil war, world wars, but we've also made amazing progress. Women's suffrage, the civil rights movement, we get caught up, I think, sometimes in the short term, the bumpy, ugly, and frustrating road that we're on. We often forget that at the state level, at the local level, amazing progress can be made, uh, whether it's housing reform and other opportunities. You see states and municipalities all the time make real progress, moving agendas forward that are supported locally. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that a system that was designed with complex checks and balances that was designed to prevent 53% or 54% imposing their will on the 47%. We shouldn't be surprised that we think it doesn't work if you're somebody who wants it to work at the federal level. The government that we're, we have wasn't designed to work the way many people do. Uh, I'll even take issue a little bit with the brain of our angels as a concept in the sense that so many people want everyone to be unified. We seem to have a real hard time just going, hey, that group over there, they think differently, they believe differently, and how they approach certain problems. Maybe it's, maybe it's not upon the federal government to solve that problem in that community, in that state. We have a very diverse, large country and it functions very well. We have a hard time, you know, when we don't get what we want, or we think the federal government can solve it all. But by and large, this is a hugely prosperous country. And when you look at its trajectory over the last 250 years, it's been amazing. It's been amazing, it's been bumpy, it's been rough but we have fought back so many things that have caused so many other countries to fail, which is why we still take in so many people each year and create such amazing wealth. So 
I think sometimes we get caught up in the emotion that we don't have what we want, but the American experiment has been, again, simply amazing when you look at the end results that we have right now. Thank you. And with that, the speakers, thank. Thank you very much for that speech. Uh, let's go first to a question uh, from uh, Kay Halpern. Ms. Halpern, please unmute yourself. Ask a question of the speaker. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I really appreciated the speaker's emphasis on uh, localities and local politics as, as a bright spot. Um, my question, though, is what's happening today in those localities where we see now increasing polarization and division um, at local school boards over issues of, you know, what should be taught in schools. And um, we see polarization over, you know, what's happening in some states with uh, local election boards, um, either at the state level or, you know, the local level or the congressional district level where uh, they are being politicized. And so these local, um, local political mechanisms are being kind of poisoned. Um, and so my question um, is for the speaker, Mr. Chairman, is what is his response to that? And how would, what, do, what does he see as a solution to what's going on now at the local level, the increasing polarization at the local level? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, maybe I'm just too much the optimist and focused on the good, but I look at states like Oregon that are working on changing single family zoning and working on zoning changes for housing policy to kind of roll back what used to be redlining uh, to create more affordable housing opportunities. Minneapolis has done something similar. Uh, in spite of all the polarization, there are many on the right who are kind of reevaluating their uh, approach to the war on drugs. And although they very much to their base will do the whole, uh, you know, they will talk about blue lives matter. They also realize that there's some needed police reform. So even in a state like North Carolina, they're working to develop a database uh, that would track law enforcement officers. So if you're fired for uh, good cause in the city of Charlotte, you can't resurface immediately on the Durham Police Department because that database that's being created will kind of track uh, those changes. So are school boards always contentious? Absolutely because parents love their kids. They have a value system that they want their kids to grow up in. Uh, that's why I support school choice. Uh, again, if you're gonna be diverse, there's gonna be 10%, 20% here and there that just aren't comfortable uh, with the school system and the direction it's going. And the best thing to do is to not force something upon them that they're not comfortable with. So you give those parents who are unhappy at that school board the option to pick a charter school or use a private school voucher Again, for me, the big thing is not forcing somebody to accept a belief system or value system that just isn't working for them for whatever reason. And again, I don't agree with a lot of the choices some people make, but I know we're in a better society if we don't force our values on somebody else uh, when we're simply talking about fairly basic things. I mean, I, you wanna let a parent do what they can with their kids. So again, those school board, I'm not gonna let a school board uh, heated discussion, uh, change my value system or perspective on the growth of the United States of America. Let's take a quick second question from Mr. Gurek. Uh, Mr. Gurek, please ask a brief question in the form of a question of the speaker. Yes, um, I, Mr. Chair, thank you. I was just, I'm curious like what the speaker thinks about a lot, like a lot of issues like climate change where it's, you've got a big national, actually, well, global um, problem where, you know, I like, I don't, I don't think there it's, you know, a bunch of local people doing their own thing just isn't going to cut it. I'm curious what the speaker thinks about that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, so there are some basically global issues. Um, but again, you're struggling when you're going to try and pose something like that, uh, basically across an entire country. That's where the innovation is there. I mean, developing electric cars that eventually become cheaper, more efficient, and a greater value than a uh, you know, fossil fuel driven vehicle. That's the federal government doesn't invent electric cars. You know, if you simply let certain ideas flourish and grow and don't overregulate them and don't make it so hard to come up with something new, states have already done this. States in the Northeast and out in California 
are, you know, creating basically little groups where they're going to work together to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, we're, as much as we uh, don't like to admit it, the amount of carbon, you know, our carbon output as a percentage of GDP, we're doing great. It's been dropping. We're actually using less carbon per individual in the United States. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying we're going to be there overnight. Um, but if you look at where we are compared to a top-down, I mean, China has a top-down economy. Uh, and it, I would say we're certainly doing much better than they are uh, as far as limiting our greenhouse gases. And I just, again, if you give people choice and let them develop, I think we will get where we need to be. And if you do things at the state level, if you let states focus on green energy and green energy policy, if they start to do better, uh, people will copy that. Uh, California has, you know, basically set standards much ahead of the EPA because California was really suffering with smog around LA. I mean, air pollution was a serious issue in California, just the way the geography is and the way air would get trapped, you know, trying to get over the mountains. It, LA was just horrific. You can, even now it's still pretty bad, but California set, went first. California set emission standards higher than the US standards. And that's why many companies like Ford and GM had to just develop cars because of the size of that market that would meet California standards, not US standards. So again, that's where, without going to the federal level, the state of California and its very blue leaning voter base basically set the bar that eventually the rest of the country had to follow. So it can be done. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Speaker. You would have been one of the greatest and profoundest of the anti-federalists, and you open up their uh, tradition into the 21st century very well. So thank you for this speech and its uh, extrapolations. With that, we are going to go to our next speaker in the affirmative. I am looking for another speaker in the affirmative, and I would like to call on Mr. Alex Weisenfels. Uh, Mr. Weisenfels, please unmute yourself. You have up to three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. I'm here to, uh, to talk about the American system failing, but if we're calling it an experiment, then yes, it was successful. We have learned that the United States Constitution is not sufficient for maintaining a healthy society. Instead of fostering prosperity, safety, vitality, and harmony, we've developed a class of political elites who maintain two major groups of constituents. Each group seems certain that their party does everything right, and the other party does everything wrong. And for the most part, it seems neither group knows or cares to find out why the other group is certain of the exact opposite. That's an easy way to maintain power while getting almost no constructive work done. And I think that problem is why most of us are here. The question on which our future depends is what is sufficient for a healthy society? Any system of government people create, any economy, any science or technology, any culture, can be subverted and corrupted for selfish purposes. And it will be unless enough people, and it doesn't even have to be a majority, learn to recognize these following things. Here we go. Um, first, they need the wisdom to recognize when it's happening that people aren't doing constructive things. And secondly, they need the will to do something about it despite personal inconvenience. People will need to learn to recognize constructive concepts, not only to maintain the systems of civilization, but also to update and upgrade them. Nobody has to be an expert in everything, but everyone should at least be able to tell whether or not a policy follows basic constructive principles. The constructive principles of investment, preparation, transcendence, and ethics are where we need to start, even before we start discussing facts. Knowing what we care about is how we know how to ask the right questions, the questions whose answers matter to us. Then we can figure out how to approach situations in ways that empower everyone. If we don't do that, neither our current system nor any system we replace it with will function in a healthy manner. However, if we can create a shared meta culture out of these constructive concepts, we'll have common ground on which we can build a world we can all be proud of. Thank you. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Let's do a round of jazz hands for the speaker. The chair smiles in particular on uh, the restoration of political virtue in the ancient sense, as the speaker has mentioned. He is curious how to go about that. So let's go to questions for the speaker to hop into that. Uh, are there any questions for the speaker? 
Are there any questions for the speaker? Okay, in that case, I will take chair privilege to ask uh, the question for the speaker this time. Uh, Mr. Spe uh, Mr. Speaker, the chair is curious um, as to whether he believes that the American system of government can survive without enlightened statesmen and without virtuous citizens. Is it possible for the American system of government to survive without the kinds of wisdom and willpower uh, which uh, the speaker has suggested are the first things we should be looking for for the preservation of freedom now? That is a good question. Uh, no, I do not believe that. I do not believe it is possible to construct a system made of people, for people, run by people, which can work if people don't know how to, how to be constructive. And so that's why I've created a vocabulary of concepts to help make that much, much easier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and the chair and many of the rest of us in the room wish you luck on that vocabulary and we will look forward to seeing it in print sometime very, very soon. Uh, with that, you, uh, the speaker is thanked and we will now go on to our next speech uh, in the negative on the resolution. I am looking for a speaker in the negative and I see Susan is raising her hand. Uh, Susan, uh, I'm going to call on you. I just have a very quick question. I was had been asking for Susan McCord. Are you Susan McCord and Scott just happens to be another name or are you uh, another Susan entirely? I am not Susan McCord. I am Susan Scott. Well, let's call on Miss Susan Scott for the next speech in the negative. Susan, uh, you have, uh, Madam Speaker, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as a fellow Socratic, I would like to note that our resolution does not provide any definition of what the experiment, the American experiment is. So for the purpose of my response, I'm going to provide a definition that I'm working on. And, and I am defining the term American experiment as the experiment in uh, representative democracy. And that seems to be one of the unique uh, characteristics of the foundation of the government as, as opposed to a pure democracy or um, some other form of um, top-down organization. So uh, my, uh, argument in the negative is that the the American experiment of representative democracy is not failing because it has never begun. The country began without representing large portions of the population, including women and slaves. Um, it has progressed to become more inclusive of segments of the individual population while also tipping over into including corporations as deserving of representation and redefining what the term representation means. And, and as in the Citizens United Supreme Court a decision that defines money and monetary contributions as free speech and allowing uh, corporations and people with extreme amounts of money to increase the weight of their representation while diminishing the weight of representation of ordinary average citizens. So I personally feel that we can't assess the success or failure of a representative democracy until we actually have a representative democracy. And so I, I am very supportive of points made by previous speakers about uh, the importance of um, getting uh, money out of politics. I, I uh, also support your cat's tail. Um, <laughs> making a good point there. Um, so so I, I feel like we have to do a thorough and, and as the previous speaker said, uh, um, informed, wise assessment of what do we want in terms of representation before we can 
uh, write the, the keel and assess whether representative democracy works. Thank you very much. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, on that note, real quick, uh, Ginger informs the speaker that she very much appreciated the speaker's definitions of uh, representative democracy, her being a Socratic herself. So thank you for that. Uh, with that, let's go to a question for the speaker. Um, I see Mr. Tony Choate has raised his hand. Uh, Mr. Choate, do you have a question for the speaker? Yes, I do. I appreciate you defining the question that we have today. And my question is, should we go back further to the Declaration of Independence and what it is defined as our goals as a government? Because almost everyone in our nation can recite, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights and so forth. Very few people can cite the next phrase that to secure these governments, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. And so is that the experiment? Do we have a government that can actually secure our rights as individuals and function? And, and... Thank you, Mr. Chuck, well, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you for that wonderful question. And uh, it's, it's very complex. I don't have a good complex answer. My brief answer is that I think we need to go even further than that, I, I think it is critical to, when we think about all men are created equal, and, and I take the term men to re, a, a reply to humans, um, that uh, yes, we, we have strayed very far away from even considering those issues of equality and fairness for every person. And so I think it would be a positive step to go back to that Declaration of Independence. And I think it would be wise to go even further as Mr. Uh, Weisenfels suggested back to real philosophical questions about what we value as a society and, and who is benefiting from that governmental structure. Thank you. And with that, the speaker is thanked, as uh, is her uh, opening of definitional questions and all this kind of thing. Uh, one of the things about the Braver Angels debates that I find always interesting is that uh, we explicitly refuse to uh, have a uh, general um, definition going into it and allow everybody to use their own definitions of some of the terms, which opens up some fascinating debates and discussions and even stranger common grounds as well. And so I'm glad that it worked out uh, in this sense. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I will look forward to hearing your speeches more moving forward. So we will now go to another speech in the affirmative. I am looking for another speech in the affirmative, and I would uh, like to call on Miss uh, Janet Kennedy. Miss Kennedy, Madam Speaker, please unmute yourself. You have up to three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. I couldn't find myself at first to unmute. Um, so I, I'm going to touch on a couple of things that people have already said, um, like a devil a little bit deeper, because I think it's great to talk about voting systems and representative democracy. But I believe uh, in order to have either of those things, you need a well-informed citizenry. And uh, we've been failing miserably in that regard, in my opinion. Um, and it, it focuses primarily in two areas, one on the media and the other on education. Um, and I'd throw parenting in there as well. But it, in terms of the media, we, we have lost local newspapers. Uh, people don't get local news there. We only have a third of the counties in the country have a daily newspaper. Um, there's literally a news desert from west of the Mississippi until you hit Arizona. In other words, no daily newspapers. I mean, there are a couple of dots here and there. People don't trust the media any longer. And I think in part that's because the media is driven by advertising and seeking of audiences rather than newsworthy uh, stories. 
what the thing that as I was looking at this, it just astounded me is that 48% of Americans get their news from social media. And we all know how unreliable that is. And then switching tack to education, I mean, we've all heard the statistics about how poorly we place on the PISA tests, and that has continued. But it's not just our ranking. The percentage of our students who take these PISA tests, which are 15-year-olds, 25% of them are poor performers, levels one and two on a six-level test. 25%. That's a failure in, in my book. And um, China has 55% of its tested students as top performers. We have 8.8. That's frightening uh, to me. It isn't about spending. We are among the top five spenders in the world on education, but our literacy, we are 125th in the world. I, I mean, this is a failure, education. And finally, I would just like to say that parents have some responsibility, excuse me, in this. Um, and a lot of them are helicopter parents, sidewalk sweepers, as I like to call them, sweeping the obstacles out of the way for their kids, which does not create independent thinkers. We need independent critical thinkers in order for democracy to work. And that's about it. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Let's go to uh, time for one question for the speaker first. Um, I see a couple of hands that have been raised. I want to see if uh, Miss Nancy Martin, Miss Martin, do you have a question for the speaker? Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not familiar with the test that um, the speaker was talking about, uh, the PISA test. Um, I wonder if she could explain that to me, please. Madam thank Speaker. You. Uh, I can, I can't uh, tell you in great detail, but if they'll allow me, um, I can put a link to it in the chat so that you're familiar. It's a program for international student assessment. It's done every three years. It tests science, reading, and math. And by the way, we always hear about reading and math. We're even worse in science. And that has always been one of our strengths is our innovation but our science scores are plummeting as well. Madam Speaker, uh, send it to your whip and then uh, the, whip will, the whips will send that along to uh, whoever is interested in seeing that by uh, personal check. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that speech. For that, the speaker is thanked. Uh, so now we're going to go to uh, our next speech in the negative on the resolution. I am looking for a speaker in the negative, and I would like to call for this next speech in the negative on uh, Mr. Chuck DiVin uh, DiVicenzo. Uh, DiVicenzo, I do DiVicenzo, great. You have up to three minutes. Thank you very much. I probably won't take that long because a lot has been spoken already. I disagree with the resolution for several reasons. First, and again, my opinion, the experiment was based on the premise from the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal which at the time, time meant that they were landowners, male and predominantly white, so they could establish a means of governing themselves independent of the British. This was an extraordinary statement of independence at the time, heroic, possibly dangerous to those who, uh, who, who committed this first step in the American experiment and led to a path to our current affairs. Second, of course, there were significant flaws and outrageous contradictions that to this day have not been remedied. However, we have moved significantly forward throughout our history, in particular, uh, the challenges post-Civil War and Reconstruction, the suffragette movement, the regular issues with immigration that continue to this day, the devastation of the Native American way of life, and the major upheavals of the labor movement, the depression, the Red Scare, world wars, civil rights, globalization, economic disparity, and the regional biases that other people have touched on. And, we will, and yet we've continued to move forward, albeit, stepping backwards at times. Last, the, re the revitalization of our melting point pot, which continues, 
has given us a constant flow of new citizens, cultural enhancements, a path for many to escape the same tyranny and lack of economic opportunities of our ancestors. It is far more complicated world uh, currently and increasingly segmented where confirmation bias allows even alternative facts at this point in time. But the majority of individuals still remain committed to forming a more perfect union. Uh, again, I don't know that we'll ever be perfect, but it gives me hope for the future as, as this, uh, this particular uh, exercise uh, proves to me. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Uh, the speaker predicted his uh, length correctly, and he only went uh, one minute and 52 seconds. Uh, but thank you for this wonderful speech in any case. Let's go to two questions for the speaker. Uh, let's first go to Mr. Richard Aberdeen. Mr. Aberdeen, please unmute yourself. Ask a question to me of the speaker. Uh, to uh, Mr. T to the chair, uh, it is my opinion that a nation is only measured by how it treats its least citizens. And homelessness and poverty is growing and it's getting far worse. It's not getting better. And you say we're moving forward. The speaker and, says, the speaker And says. my question is, how can you say we're moving forward? How can the speaker say? Yeah, how can the speaker say we're moving forward when in fact the wealth gap keeps growing, corporations are now people, which is just ignorance. And, uh, and we have uh, people sleeping out in the open and, and the federal government does not care one iota how many people here are sleeping out under bridges and stuff. How can you say we're moving forward? Thank you very much, Mr. Aberdeen. Mr. Speaker. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's, a, it's an important one and a good one. And I think part of the, part of the issue becomes uh, what what are we asking our government to do? So, in fact, you know, if you work with, um, uh, as I've had an opportunity to work with new citizens, for instance, I'm up in Minneapolis. We have a huge Somali and Hmong population. If you ever go to uh, one of those, one of their um, uh, when they when they swear in as new citizens and, and seeing the hope and what have you of an individual that came here with nothing and had the opportunity to do different things. So that's where my encouragement comes. I'm not saying they're not incredible problems. I think that we have both, as, as people mentioned, on a local level, on a regional level, and on a national level. But again, the discourse has to be uh, it, it, it increasing, like in this particular sense, uh, rather than, um, uh, I, I guess the opportunity for those folks would never have been, never have been, been around when, uh, when, when uh, the, the words were spoken of all men are created equal, uh, because it, it just eliminated so many people. So we're in a far better place than we were. And I think that, you know, Again, those economic uh, uh, disparities are an issue, and, and we do have to work on them. All right. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Mr. DiVicenzo, and thank you for this uh, perspective here. With that, we're going to go to another speech in the affirmative. Um, and uh, by the way, we are uh, running on really good time right now. I'm excited how uh, how this is going. So we'll have time for at least, uh, at least a few more speakers. So let's go first to a speech in the affirmative from Mr. Jeff Howey. Uh, Mr. Howie, please unmute yourself. You have up to three minutes. Hey, thanks for having me. So uh, my speech in the affirmative is one that the affirmative is the experiment has almost failed. And I want to bring things to light that some of you may know, some of you may not. Um, if you picture a map of the United States and you picture an overlay of that map with corporations, and this is provable. I want you all to check this out when we're done with this whole debate. Is go to Dun and Brad Dun and Brad Street, search on the city of blank. I live in Las Cruces, New Mexico, so it's the city of Las Cruces, New Mexico. In Dun and Brad Street, you will find they have an EIN number. It'll state their corporation, when they were founded, how many companies are related. You can do this for every city, every county, every state, every school board, every judgeship all across the nation. What this means is that when you go to the school board and they don't listen to you, they're a corpor corporation and they don't have to. You elected them supposedly, but they don't answer to you. Same with the governor. The governor's the CEO of your state, called a governor, but they're the CEO of the corporation of your state. Why do we have people January 6th still in jail 
what happened to a speedy trial, they have no rights in jail because they don't have rights, they're citizens. That's the scary part. If you're a citizen of the United States, you're a citizen of the United States of America, the corporation. And they declared you don't have rights. This may upset some people, but this is fact. It's all documented. And I would challenge everyone here to understand that unless we the people rise up as men and women, not citizens, and there's a whole thing on this versus lawful versus legal, I hate to tell you this, but your all caps name that is on all of your financial documents represents a dead person, a person that is not a live human being. And I know that some of you may be blown away what I'm saying, but unless we get back to the fact that we the people have control over government and we are over the government as men and women, nothing will change to change the affirmative of a fail we can turn this around, but we have to educate ourselves of that fact. Thank you. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We'll go to a couple of questions in just one second here. But as uh, a, a uh, historically voracious reader who has just recently finished reading uh, uh, some, uh, some writings of the pamphleteering of the early American revolutionary period, it is fascinating to hear and also very heartening to hear the echoes of Many of the uh, the the early times uh, always harkening back across history, including sometimes now. So thank you for this speech. Um, so let's go to uh, at least two questions for the speaker. I want to give the first question to Mr. Chandler Skinner. Uh, Chandler, please unmute yourself and ask a question of the speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to ask the previous speaker um, if he could share any other um, evidence that uh, public groups or corporations, aside from them having an EIN, given that anyone who employs individuals has an EIN, public or private? Well, you have to do your homework. Uh, one of the people I strongly recommend you check out is a guy named David Strait. Um, I listened to a group of five videos that were two and a half hours long each. This is even after I had realized this, but his series is called We're at War, with, uh, War with the Bar. When you realize that all of the judgeships across America are corporations, for-profit corporations, then you have to ask yourself, how is that possible? And what is behind this? And so we, we go to them for justice, but you're not showing up. You're, you're being represented in court. You're not being represented. You're being represented. And so when you understand that and you understand what an attorney is doing as a member of the bar, and it, it's just, it's huge, it's, it's monstrous. So that would be the next thing I'd, you know, there's other people that you can get education from, but David Strait does a great job of breaking it down to that simple level that helped me understand things even more broadly and how it affects everything that we do from the prop. There's even an overlay on the counties. You know, a plat map is an overlay of what was originally there. They overlaid something over your original land. And that disturbed me greatly because we think of lot this and lot that, that's the fictitious overlay of the property that you own. So there's a lot to this. I hope that answers your question. Let's go to a second quick question from uh, Mr. Paul Norris. Uh, Paul, please unmute yourself, ask a question to me of the speaker. So California recently had a recall election of a governor unsuccessful though it was, but the uh, there was the possibility of recalling a governor through a ballot proposition. How would the speaker reconcile this with claiming that California is a corporation and uh, Newsom is the uh, CEO? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's a facade, and that's the best thing I can explain. You know, when our local school board just uh, did something that the entire town is in uproar over. They didn't listen to the people at all. They didn't listen to the people when they changed the name of a school a year ago. And the overwhelming majority didn't want it to happen. So then you have to ask the question, why didn't this referendum succeed? Why did these school boards and so forth choose to ignore the will of the people that elected them? It's because they don't have to. Now, if we wanna get into election stuff, just go look at the research on what happened in 2020, what happened in California. Um, look at Otero County, New Mexico. It's making history in the nation and it's worth checking out. That's all I'll say. 
And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, thank for you. your speech, and uh, thank you for being here today. So, all right, with that, we are going to go to a uh, speech in the negative on the resolution. Uh, I am looking for speeches in the negative on the resolution. Again, the uh, question here is resolved. The American experiment is failing. Do we have speeches in the negative? Um, I have seen uh, Mr. Uh, Butch Sasavik's uh, hand up since the beginning of the debate. So Mr. Sasavik, I'd like to call on you. You have up to three minutes for a speech in the negative on the resolution. Thank you. I have a question for the chair though. I, yes, interpret yes, I interpreted the question a bit different than what was mentioned. So I don't have a political uh, conversation but I do talk about the extinction or existential, two major existential threats to America. If you'd rather pass me by, I'll, I'll do that. Um, you so have I, see that I, I see, I took the first words are America on the brink. I think we were on a brink, yep. which is different, slightly different than what your definition was, which was, is it failing? Uh, I, Mr. Sazavik, uh, can you just give a very quick, um, just in a couple words, the themes that you'd like to discuss? I'd like to keep this conversation on the political side, but if you can tell me what the themes are, I might let you go. Okay, I think we're in, a, a, for example, uh, um, uh, climate change. We cannot have a conversation about climate change. And the current, move, the current uh, decisions that are being made by the government are threatening our country. The second one is uh, social uh, uh, social uh, equity. Uh, we cannot have a conversation because we get thrown into very bad situations and therefore we are not really addressing the problems and it's destroying my country. This is, this is very much in order. So go ahead and take another two and a half minutes. Please uh, go on. So. Okay. But, uh, uh, oh, oh uh, I'm sorry, sir. We're looking for a speech in the negative though. This sounds like a speech in the affirmative. I guess it is. Okay, um, I'm going to call on another speaker then. Um, thank you for this. Uh, I'll see if we can get you in one of the next ones. I can't promise it, but we'll try. Um, I'd like to call on Mr. Uh, Alistair McLeod for a speech in the negative on this resolution. Alistair? Alistair, uh, you are still on mute. Okay, am I there now? Yep, you have three minutes. Okay, I probably don't need the full three minutes. Um, I want to make a plea for faith in our capacity as a nation for positive change. Uh, it can't be a blind faith. It has to be an intelligent, critical, and thoughtful faith. We are facing horrific problems um, uh, internally, and a lot of people don't want to uh, uh, face how um, self-destructive um, uh, a path we're on. So I agree very much with the fear that people have. But I re absolutely refuse to give up on America. Um, uh, and uh, I think if we um, uh, don't uh, stand on faith in this extraordinary experiment, which has suffered some really, really serious tests in its history, as many other of the speakers have explained, um, then we truly have no hope. So I am simply saying, think observe, criticize, but have faith, be constructive, and believe that we can change. That's it. And with that, the speaker is thanked for his brief and concise speech. Let's go to a couple of questions. Uh, first question from Mr. Henry McHenry. Uh, Mr. McHenry, please unmute yourself, ask a question to me of the speaker. Hello, I have a two-part question in two forms. One is, um, what makes anyone think that there is such a thing as the American people to hear from. And the second way to say that is, where does America reside? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You may take that however you wish. Um, I don't think that there was ever a time in American history where it was harder to identify who is America than the Civil War. Uh, because that threatened the dissolution of the nation, but the nation did not dissolve. That's the only answer I can give to that question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, let's go to a second question from uh, Mr. Sam C. Uh, Sam, please unmute yourself and uh, ask a question of uh, the speaker, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair, for taking my question. My 
Question for the speaker is, are you defining faith as the ability to sacrifice for the greater good? Thank you. That's a, a wonderful question. I don't think I've thought it out. Um, uh, certainly we have to have humility um, uh, in the face of, uh, uh, of disagreement because we may be wrong about some things. Um, uh, that that's a form of self-sacrifice. Um, certainly we have to think about the common interest um, uh, and that very, very well involved uh, some level of uh, self-sacrifice. Um, we can't, uh, um, I am pretty badly disillusioned with the, uh, the, 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 uh, the invisible hand, the Adam Smith, um, the greed is good um, idea. I, I do not think that we're gonna make it into a positive future. Uh, so yes, we have to prepare to make personal um, sacrifices uh, for the greater good. Yes, absolutely. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Mr. McLeod, for this framing here. So, all right, we're going, to, we're going to go to another speech in the affirmative. Um, given the way things are going, I think we will probably have time for a few more speeches. So let's go to a speech in the affirmative. And I would like to call on uh, Ms. Mary Greer. Uh, Ms. Greer, you have up to three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think that the American experiment we're talking about is whether we could establish a society in which people can govern themselves. Um, this question arose at a time when we were on the leading edge of a worldwide rebellion against uh, totalitarian feudal systems. Um, and it was a very much open question. Um, our system was flawed from the start, as others have said, it was built on slavery and indentured servitude and the treatment of women as property. And it took a long time for that to change. I look around us today and I see that we are uh, one of the countries in the world that has the greatest income inequality. We're one of the most violent. We have one of the highest incarceration rates. We're one of the most corrupt. Uh, the institutions of democracy are under attack everywhere, including public education. We have people who do not trust government, who do not trust any institution. We are sorting ourselves into two groups, red and blue. Um, and it's all about power. It's about elected officials wanting to maintain power, wanting to control others, about people in the minority wanting to perpetuate control over the majority. Um, it's about partisanship and partisan politicians wanting to control for their own benefit, for their own agenda. Um, there's a phenomenon described as the doom loop where um, those in power don't want to give it up and they become increasingly frenetic about the possibility that they might lose and they become extreme. They engender um, feelings of hatred and fear towards those who are not of their party so that they can whip up the base and maintain their political control. And we have this increasing um, lack of trust and feeling of um, belonging in our society um, and the sorting becomes worse. And we have uh, a significant minority of people. Um, all I have to say is January 6th, people who were willing to take up arms, go down to the Capitol and overthrow our government. I do not define that as a successful experiment. I think that what Braver Angels is doing is trying to look at the basic question of whether we have enough in common or can direct our attention towards the things we have in common to get back to the social compact that we tried to build in the beginning and see if we can reestablish it in some way to, uh, what, to de determine whether we have enough that we can, and I will wrap this up, that we can rebuild a society that is not as violent, that has trust, that works together towards the common good. And I hope that we can, but I fear that uh, given what we've seen, we're on the path towards tyranny and we don't have a lot of time to lose. 
And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, in the interest of getting a few more speeches in, I'm going to cut off uh, questions uh, for these last couple of speakers. Uh, so we will now go to our next speech in the negative. Uh, but uh, Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, thank you for your speech. I'm looking for a speech in the negative. I'd like to call on Mr. Steve Hausworth. Steve, you have up to uh, three minutes. Uh, please take up to three minutes. You're still on mute. Uh, you are still on mute, Mr. Hausworth. Uh, you are still on mute. Let me help you a little bit. There, there we go. go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Take three minutes. Yeah, very good. So I really appreciated Mary Greer's presentation, but for a number of the reasons she presented, I think that our experiment is proceeding and progressing successfully. You have to remember that the mechanisms to manage a democracy and particularly a representative democracy are several and they work in conjunction with each other at times and in opposition to each other at times. And I do agree also that there's a huge ideological component across the, the United States, but that's not necessarily to be considered a negative because people are expressing themselves, right? The First Amendment. Similar to science, our democracy is progressing in different directions at different times and coming back to center and then going off in different directions. Science doesn't always proceed in a linear direction. It's very curvilinear and very um, broken at times, but it proceeds. And so I really think that uh, our judiciary, our representatives, our executive are working together. One of the problems though, is that our government has increased in size significantly. And personally, I would like to see our government shrink in size to a certain degree by having less power in the executive, less ideology in the representative, and more uh, diversity in the judicial. So how do we accomplish those things? By representative elections, right? Um, the other thing, I'd, I'll be uh, completely um, uh, open and transparent here. I formed a group called the FIT Party, which stands for Facts, Integrity, Transparency, as a political party that is not ideological, that is based on the foundations of our constitution. And the more, as, as I hear different in the positive and the negative, the more people can operate without ideology, but focused on what the constitution states, which is our rule book, I think the better off we'll be and the more center we'll become and maybe progress in a more linear fashion instead of a more hectic fashion. That's all I have to say. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for your insights. And there's a couple of phrases in there that stuck out to me that I'll be mulling for a while. So thank you for that. Uh, with that, we're going to go to our last speaker in the affirmative. And uh, because of uh, a uh, um, slight uh, clerical error on my friend, I would like to go and uh, uh, open the room for uh, Mr. Sazavik to uh, give the last speech in the affirmative. Uh, I apologize for my, my mistake earlier. Mr. Sazavik. Thank you. Uh... You have up to three minutes. Yeah, as I said, I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about two specific things. I think there are many things that are threatening America. And right now I'm, I'm an a, a unabashed, confirmed supporter of America. I've been to 71 different countries. Most of the, most of the uh, countries that are in the, in the, uh, behind Iron, Iron Curtain and all. So I have a rather good understanding of our political system. But let's get to it. Uh, number one is uh, climate change. Right now, if you say to somebody, uh, I've got a question about climate change, the answer you get, it's settled science. I'm a scientist. No science is settled, particularly something that's predict wants to try to predict something 50 years from now. Now we can argue about the science. I don't wanna do that. I, wanna do, I do wanna mention something that I've written about uh, over a year ago, that we are putting our country in a very dangerous situation. We're reducing our uh, fossil fuel support uh, while our enemies are increasing their fossil fuel support. We will get to a situation if we don't change, it's similar to Germany. They closed all of their nuclear uh, plants 
and uh, close their uh, coal plants. And where are they? They're now depending on, on uh, Putin and all of that. That's, so, so I don't think there's been good thoughts about what are the consequences of doing what we're doing, whether we think it's right or not. And, and unfortunately, uh, people, get shot, people like me get shot, shouted down. Same thing for woke racism. Um, that, that should be a, a whole subject for another time, but look at the results that we have. The things that are happening, I, I don't necessarily, and I usually get sometimes be, being called a racist when I say we're doing the wrong things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing something, but we're doing the wrong things. In Oregon, we've now reduced, we've dumbed down. You can now graduate high school without having proficiency in English or in math. Uh, they just spent a whole bunch of money in Portland for the last couple of years trying to solve problems with, uh, with the racism or blacks and they published a report, spent with money and it's totally gone. Uh, we've been focusing more on white guilt and looking for whites to get a solutions to all of this. And in fact, I think the bigger problem is we go from here's the problem and here's the solution. No one looks at what are the causes for the problem so we can know what to deal with. To give you one last example, and I've got really much more to say about this. I went to a school in Brooklyn called uh, Bishop Lachlan Memorial High School. At the time, it was a, it was a school that a attracted many students from all over the city. <clears throat> and uh, I hated the school, but I got the best education that I could. And right now, they instituted, they opened up a number of schools, and this was in the, now it's a local school. It's 100% Black, 96% graduation rate. 94% first choice. I don't think anybody has gone to Lachlan and said, what the hell are you doing? This is great stuff. No, we go someplace else. Two other quickies. Number one, I get a little bit of satisfaction with the political system by voting for myself. Well, I came in second in Oregon and also I came in sec a third in, in a national election. And the last thing is I have tried to do a cohort myself and, and chair, maybe you can find a way to to talk to, to people at Braver Angels, something that I call purple power. People that want to get beyond understanding and try to find common places where we could begin to do something other than understanding. Thank you. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for your concerns and for your thoughts and for your framing of everything here. It has been helpful for this debate. Um, let's go to a final uh, speech in the negative on this resolution. Um, I'm looking for a final speech to the negative, and I would like to call on uh, Mr. Paul Norris to close us out. Mr. Norris, you have up to three minutes. Uh, so I wanted to just start by saying the United States has lasted because it was not founded in excessive idealism, unlike the French Revolution or the communist revolutions. Um, it's imperfect, uh, but it's resilient. It allows for change. I mean, look at the change that's happened in the nation over its lifetime. And it continues to create wealth. And both of those things are necessary for stability. I would say a constitutional republic has been shown to be far more stable than a democracy. Um, and the historical and political knowledge of the fathers was incredible. I mean, these guys really knew their history of at least everything that had happened to date when they created uh, this nation and the constitution. Um, I remember, uh, I can remember back to the 1960s, remember Jesus Christ superstar facing a dying nation? And guess what? We had some of our best decades ever after that prediction in the 1960s. Um, democracy, what a wonderful thing. Socrates was condemned to death by a purely democratic process with 500 jurors. <laughs> um, and I would also like to distinguish attacks on privilege, which I condone, from attacks on excellence, which is something entirely different. Um, there's an example of this great uh, national quality high school in San Francisco called Lowell uh, that has produced lots of incredible people who have contributed to our country. And it's being attacked because somehow it doesn't end up, you know, with the right racial ratio. But strangely enough, it's not predominantly white, <laughs> but it's still not the right ratio. 
Um, and so one of the greatest high schools in the country may end up losing its tradition of excellence. So again, attacks on excellence are not what we need right now. Um, genius solutions are the things, are something that is really, really important to changing the quality of our lives. We need genius solutions and we need an environment where genius can thrive and produce its best results. And that is my plea. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Thank you very much, Mr. Norris, for this speech. All right, with that, uh, we are just about out of time. We're about to run over time. And so I am going to have this debate adjourned in one second. But before we adjourn, I just want to let everybody know there's going to be a quick debrief session. Uh, and you're all encouraged to stay for the debrief. Uh, if you have to leave right at the top of the hour, um, that's perfectly OK. But we will be doing some uh, quick announcements about next steps uh, shortly after the hour after we finish the debrief. So with that, I'm looking for a, uh, a motion to adjourn this debate. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I see it. All right. Uh, do we have a second to the motion to adjourn? All right. With that, this debate is adjourned and uh, we are now outside of debate mode. Thank you, everybody. This has been a fascinating thing for me to chair for multiple reasons. And um, a lot of thoughts have been going through my head, but I want to hear from you all uh, what thoughts are going through your heads first. So uh, at this point, we're going to go into the debrief that we do um, after every Braver Angels debate, the two questions that you may respond to and should respond to for the debrief are number one, what did you learn? And number two, what did you enjoy? Um, we'll do a little bit of raised hands, but you're also welcome to uh, uh, chat in the chat, which is open now, um, things that you learned or enjoyed and other thoughts. Um, and you're also welcome to unmute yourself and, uh, and tell us what you learned or enjoyed vocally. So, um, uh, Kay, Kay, let's start with you. Um, yeah, I, um, I enjoyed uh, hearing about a lot of really um, fascinating ideas. So I had never heard, for example, of uh, what was it, um, uh, max voting. Uh, so oh, that sounds maybe. very, that sounds very intriguing. Um, and I also thought that a lot of people on both sides of the resolution, you know, brought up some very interesting issues dialing for dollars of, uh, you know, that political uh, politicians in both parties have to do. I bet if they, and then someone else talked about, you know, the seating in Congress, you know, maybe if they sat based on, you know, not based on party, but like alpha order by name, which is kind of random, they would mix and get to know each other and they could commiserate about how awful it is to have to dial for dollars all the time. And maybe then they could change that. Um, and so many other interesting things. Um, and I also thought what um, the last speaker just mentioned about how America is resilient because it's not so much based on ideology like the French or the Russian revolutions. I thought that was really interesting. So I really appreciated hearing all the speakers and learning so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, everybody, you'll note that the chat is open, so uh, please feel free to say in the chat what you learned and what you enjoyed. Um, we'll keep it open for a few minutes. Uh, I saw Stephen Lumsdane had his hand up. Stephen, what did you learn and what did you enjoy? Um, I was just going to say um, I learned there was a number of, of really good things about maybe things that can help us move in a good direction. Um, and it's always really good to hear what we can actually do. And I enjoyed, I think more so than any other debate that I've been to, it seemed like this one had people from red and blue arguing the same side in multiple areas. So that was that was really cool to see and know that on a lot of these issues, a lot of us agree and we're not as divided as maybe we think. Thank you for the part you played in that. Uh, Gary Holland, Connecticut Braver Angels. What did you learn? What did you enjoy? Uh, you're still on mute. Um, I didn't really mean to raise my hand. Sorry about that. But um, I enjoyed actually, I really thought that the session was very well run. Um, I think that the comments, both of the speakers and the questions that were posed were good. The interaction was very positive. Um, I come away with a better understanding of both sides of uh, both sides of the question. I still remain uh, sort of undecided and neutral between the two sides. Um, but I very much appreciate the efforts. Uh, of uh, of the organizers. Thank you.
Thank you for being here. Uh, Richard Aberdeen, what did you learn? What did you enjoy? Richard, you're still on mute. I had never heard about the uh, alternate way to vote. Uh, but uh, the problem is, is we can't get anybody in a lot of states to even make it fair to vote. And so I don't know how to change the vote if we can't change making it fair to vote. That may well be a topic of a subsequent debate or workshop, so stay yeah, tuned. Maybe, maybe there should be a debate whether John Lewis was right or wrong and why. <laughs> Thank um, you, Mr. Aberdeen. It's always good to see you and hear you in these debates. I look forward to seeing you in another one soon. Um, let's go to uh, Chuck Edson. What did you learn? What did you enjoy? Well, what I learned was, uh, I, except for a few people wearing red or some people wearing blue conspicuously, I could not tell from the comments and observations, who was where. Uh, so that was that was nice to see. And um, yeah, I've been realizing that uh, we're less divided than we are being convinced. And uh, thank you. Thank you for being here, Chuck. I want to take a few more. Let's go first to uh, Linda Thompson. Linda, what did you learn? What did you, you enjoy? Hi. I just really want to say how much I appreciate the fairness of the moderator and the diversity of the attendees. I'm heartened by the fact that I'm seeing participants and hearing participants of different ages and persuasions, and we're all listening to each other respectfully, which is probably one of the best examples of being American. So thank you. Thank you for being here, Linda. Um, let's go to uh, Dave Lindley. Dave, what did you learn? What did you enjoy? Dave? Uh, Dave, uh, we cannot hear you, so we'll go to another one. Um, uh, Sean Falver, what did you learn? What did you enjoy? Um, this was my first debate, so it was really nice to be here. And um, I, one of the things that, that I did not know about the voting, some of the voting things either, so that was uh, great. And some of the other terms and things that came up that I wrote down, I didn't know about. But um, I, I really appreciate that you know, with all this diversity, it sort of, to me, confirmed that um, for me, the experiment has not failed because look at all of these people, whether whatever side you're on, um, we're interested in this. And so to me, that that sort of affirms and gave me hope. So it, it was uh, really nice to be here. Thank you for having been here and been a part of it. Uh, Mr. Sazavik, what did you learn? What did you enjoy? You guys are great. The kind of uh, uh, discussions here are fabulous and the leaders are terrific. So I'm going to make a request for you, Luke, personally, since you're a good guy. I'd like you to come to my apartment, my condo, and it's in Portland. And I'd like you to walk in front of me as I leave my condo and uh, explain to my neighbors that I'm really a good guy with an open mind. And that just because I may have voted for Trump or myself, you ought to listen to me for a minute. I'm tired of getting beat up for something that I am rather than what I think about. Mr. So, will you do that, Luke? Mr. Sazavik, I cannot promise you when the next time I will be in Portland is, but uh, let's keep chatting. And the best way we can keep chatting is uh, for you to come to many more of these Braver Angels events and help us uh, bring this work to many more people. Thank you for having been here today. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's go to uh, Alistair McLeod, and then we will go to we will do our final debrief. Uh, Alistair, what did you learn? What did you enjoy? Uh, I learned that the level of um, sophistication um, that uh, can appear in a gathering like this is extraordinary. Um, the the the, the I, I was blown away by by the the, the, the historical and political. Um, uh, 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 acumen of, of the speakers. Um, I thought it was a very, very well run um, debate. Thank you. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, my plea was don't give up hope. Well, this session certainly gives me hope. If there's people in America who can think like this, we're not finished. <laughs> 
Thank you for having been here and thank you for your participation. All right, so we are going to go and uh, close off the debrief and do some final announcements. Uh, but before the final announcements, I want to invite a dear friend of mine who has been very patient with me on things that he should not have been patient with me on. And so I appreciate his forbearance and forgiveness, who has been doing some wonderful work bringing this national program to the local levels to help Braver Angels Alliances and other folks do these debates in their local communities. And his name is Steve Warsaw. He was one of the whips this afternoon. Um, Steve, Steve, please come here and give us the, uh, the Braver Angels pitch before we do our final closeout. It is a deep honor to give the pitch for this organization, which is committed to depolarizing the country. And we do that in part by having this kind of conversation. Where else in the country, what other organization could you attend and have this kind of a discussion? Braver Angels is really if not unique, highly distinct in bringing together blues and reds and purples and people in between and giving them the opportunity to listen to and learn from each other, not just what they think, but why they think it, what personal experiences have informed the way they see things. Clearly, you heard things today from which you learned, you learned something. I suspect that you heard things today that you deeply disagreed with, as well as deeply agreed with. This is the kind of experience that happens in our debates at the national and at the local level. We also have over 70 alliances in the country that are putting on community debates just like this. We offer town halls where you get to meet with your public officials that you've elected so that you can give them what you think and hear about obstacles and opportunities in the future. We have one-on-one -on -one opportunities where you get paired with somebody on the other side of the political divide and given a kind of a script where you can talk with each other and have a an a respectful, even empathetic conversation. These kinds of experiences are what it takes to get us to finding common ground so that we can work together. So we encourage you to consider joining Braver Angels if you have not yet done so. Now, how much does that cost? That's probably one thing you would ask in a capitalistic society, I guess a huge figure of $12 a year. That is all, that's all the dues that we ask of you. Certainly, if you want to give more, we're welcome that with open arms. But that's what would get you in to our organization. You'd be receiving newsletters, notifications about various kinds of events. We offer probably 12 to 14 different kinds of events for people to learn skills about talking across the divide, many others. So I know all of the staff of this debate appreciate the opportunity to have been here and to have heard just the wealth of ideas and um, really looking for, you know, how can we talk to each other profitably in a, in a valuable way and make progress on the problems that we have also identified. So. Thank you for being here. And, and back to you, Luke. Steve, thank you for having given the pitch. And everybody, thank you for having been here. I just want everybody to join me in a quick round of jazz hands, uh, not for the debate and not for all of you here, but specifically for the whips who were here, Steve and Morgan and Paul uh, and, um, uh, and Beth and Chandler. Uh, for having been here and helped make my life easier and having helped make this debate happen. We really couldn't have done it without you guys. You guys are the coolest whips in town. And as always, it's a pleasure and honor working with each between these debates more and more people. And on that note, let me just mention to everybody else that we could not do anything we do in Braver Angels without the labor and creative, uh, creative thinking and sheer dedication of hundreds of volunteers around the country working on many teams, some doing stuff online, some doing stuff locally, some doing stuff a lot, some doing stuff a little, but always helping us make uh, this work of our grassroots organization keep flowing. 
Uh, most of the Zoom staff here are volunteers. Me and Chandler are staff, um, and, uh, and there's a few other staff scattered around the country doing administrative work. But the vast majority of the folks inside Braver Angels are uh, volunteers who give out of their own free will, their own time to help make America a better place and help bring the things that we've found in events like this and in processes like this, and in the things that we hold ourselves to here, helping bring that to more and more of our fellow Americans. And we all know people who are polarized and we all know people who we're polarized on as well. And uh, we really believe very strongly in Braver Angels that unless we hold ourselves to the processes and to the ideals and values of seeing the good in each other and doing our best, even when it's at its most hard, um, only if we do that with ourselves can we uh, bring that kind of work um, to our fellow Americans who need it as much as we do. Um, and uh, as we approach the 2024 election and many more times uh, to come, we'll still need it just as much. So uh, from our beloved community to yours, from our House United to the rest of the United States of America, we look forward to doing more of this stuff with you. And we invite you with open arms, not only to join us as a member, um, although you're very welcome to do that, that's always uh, something that we uh, rejoice in, but to come, if you want to take this work and bring it to people you know, to communities you know, to think of strategic creative ways to help influence America in the best ways moving forward, we are always looking for more people to help us. We're always looking for more people to join our teams and to join us because we really couldn't do it without the energy of the American people. And uh, as all uh, members of the American people, um, we, uh, we know of which we speak. So join us and we look forward to seeing you on some of these. Meantime, just a very quick announcement. The next debate is going to be on a Thursday, Thursday, uh, March 31st. Uh, and that will be uh, coming up um, in just a few weeks here. So mark your calendars. After that, we have national online debates on April 7th, the Thursday evening and April 21st, another Thursday evening. And aside from that, there will be lots and lots of workshops and other smaller programs um, coming out as well as uh, things happening at the local levels and also uh, 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 various speaker events and various media offerings coming up soon too. There's a lot of interesting work happening in Braver Angels right now. There's a lot of uh, things that we are going to be rolling out very shortly over the summer months and as we approach the 2022 midterm elections. And we invite you not only to follow us in that, but also to join us in whatever uh, whatever way you think is best. So, um, so we will look forward to seeing you all on many future debates and events. And in the meantime, thank you for having been with us here and helped us think through uh, the current American crisis, the current American experiment, and seeing whether we, a free and self-governing people, can uh, get through the failures and the promises of the American experiment as we move forward into another age for the American life. So thank you all for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you all in a future debate.